God, we acknowledge you in this place right now as Lord, King, Savior. Just submit right now to the authority of your word. We pray that you would bend our hearts towards you right now as we open your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and invade our space here this morning and take away anything that is not of you. Get away, get distractions out of here and help us to focus upon you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, well, why don't we uh, grab some lights out in there, please, if you don't mind, so they can get a copy of God's Word in your hand, right? Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we're going to be studying chapter 7, uh, verse 7 through 11. Are those all the way up? Can you get them all the way up? Just the, I, it's important they get their eyes on God's Word. That's the most important thing. Don't get your eyes on me. Get your eyes on God's Word. And uh, like I said, open up to Matthew chapter 7. And uh, while you're turning, I just want to say that over the last... Oh, six, eight, nine months, somewhere around there. There's just been this thing that God's trying to get through to this stubborn, you know, rock-headed, pig-headed Jew. And uh, any of you ever feel that way? Like, he's just talking to you about this one thing, and you're just not getting it, and you, you know he's telling you to do it, and you just don't get it, right? And he keeps knocking at your door. Do this, do it, right? So the thing with me is that no matter what pastor I'm listening to online, no matter what conference I would go to, the guy could be preaching about um, uh, uh, stewardship or something, and, and what I'm writing in my notebook is the word prayer and circling it. Like no matter what is being taught, that's all I'm hearing from heaven is prayer, right? And it's it's very important to God. And and so I I, I really have... Uh, passed on to our other pastors here at the church that that thing I brought that to them like God's impressing that on me I think that's the thing for 2009 uh, 2019 is that he wants his house to be a house of prayer not just that it happens while we're here but that we're that type of people that prays you know it's super super important to God so it's not just that he was knocking on my door he's knocking on all of our doors you know it says in scripture listen to this the word pray like not prayer not praying, not prayers, no, just the word pray, 316 times in one book, right, 316, I don't know, it has something to do with Jesus, I guess, right, he's the word of God and he says pray, right, 316 times, so it's like super, super important, right, that we pray, it's on his heart that we pray, and so we need to pray, and so much so that we need to become a house of prayer that that the leadership of the church was praying about prayer, and we sensed that, that the people that God had sent, Carlos and Alicia Rivera, would lead a prayer endeavor here in our church to build prayer into the DNA of this people and to incorporate prayer into every single thing that we do here because God wants it and great things happen when his people pray. And so we need to pray, 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 pray. Right now, they've got a group of people from our church, and they're actually meeting with them, and they're discipling them on this matter of prayer, teaching them what prayer is. Why do we do it? How do we do it? We want to see things happen in our church. So we're big on prayer. And so when I got to this section of Scripture, you can see the undivine title. It's not God's Word, but the title there in most Bibles, what does it say? Effective prayer. Like, so when I saw that, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm excited about this. I hope you're excited about it as well. And so we want to study effective prayer. That section of scripture that I asked you to turn to, like, that's all about prayer, right? If you've been in church at all, if you've read your Bible at all, and Joe, why don't you have a copy of God's word in front of you, brother? There we go. That a boy. There we go. Just making sure. This section, if you're familiar with it at all, is Jesus telling us to keep praying. Right? Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Why, why are you going to stop praying? Don't stop praying, right? And, and I've, I've, listen, I've heard the sermon a hundred different ways of, you know, yeah, keep praying because your blessing's right around the corner. You know, you've heard that message before. But I don't think that that's really the essence of this section of the text at all. I don't think that's really what it's all about. I think we kind of, that's a skimming of the surface, kind of a entry-level message on this stuff. I think there's something that's deeper there that's more meaningful there that Jesus is teaching us and he's talking about effective prayer and I don't know that effective prayer always necessarily means continuing to pray about it 
No, what we're looking for is effective prayer because sometimes it happens the first time you pray, right? And sometimes it happens the second or the third, and sometimes it happens on the 465,000th time that you pray. But what's most important is that we want effective prayer, not just repetitive over and over, keep asking till something happens, but effective prayer, meaning prayer that re produces a result, prayer that finds the solution that gets the answer, that receives the provision, that evokes the healing power of God. That's effective prayer. And that's what we should be going after all the time here as a people. Now, here's some prayers that we don't need. These are worthless prayers, okay? But they're all too common. First one is pretty prayer. Oh, I could just sit around and listen to her pray all day long. You know what I'm talking about? Real pretty, real pretty. You know the prayer that when it's their turn to pray, all of a sudden, their normal talk, which is kind of like this right here, but all of a sudden, she turns into a poet. And, and her, her, her or him, their language completely shifts and changes to, oh, dear, precious Heavenly Father and Heaven Sovereign King, thus thou king. And they turn into King James right there at that moment, right? It's like, what is this? What are you even saying, thou, thus, thee? Just talk, right? Just talk. We don't need pretty prayers. As a matter of fact, Jesus kind of talked about that in the chapter before in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, talking about the people that get up and pray in front of people just so they can go, hey, that's a good prayer. Like, he doesn't like that, right? He wants effective prayer. That's one thing we don't need is pretty prayers. The other worthless prayer is uh, prolonged prayer. Prolonged prayer. That doesn't mean you're going against what he's saying about keep on asking. I'm talking about prolonged prayer, this one prayer. And I get up and there's something I want God to do. And so I ask that same thing in 27 different directions, so just to make sure I cover all my bases, so in case God didn't get it the first 26 times, he'll understand it when I explain it this way. Just keep on going on and on and on and on about the same issue over and over and over again. He had something to say about that too in Matthew chapter six, verse seven, he says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again, don't be like them. <laughs> That's what he said. So Jesus, the word of God, the second person of the Trinity, he's like, when you pray to my dad, just get to the point, man. And he goes and he gives him an example of how to pray. And that's that song that we just sang. You know, our Father art in heaven, how, like, God, you're awesome. This is what I need. Can you help me out? And at the same time, help me not to stumble. Amen. Like, get to the point, man. And so we don't need pretty prayers. We don't need prolonged prayers. What we're looking for is producing prayers. We want pr prayers that produce something. Prayers that produce a result. That's what we should be going after all the time. N listen, not just habit prayers. You know, hey, it's dinner time. Hey, it's bedtime. Getting ready to drive. Getting ready to go. This is, you know, getting ready to go on a trip. Let's pray before we drive. Right? Are those good things? Yeah, we should do those things. For sure, right? But don't limit it to that. Th th those are obligatory habit formed you know, over time, this is what we do, duty, I have to do this, like, the food's not going to be good for me unless I ask Jesus to bless it, like, I might die tonight if I go to sleep without praying, like, that's not, that's not the apex of our prayer life, okay, not at all, what he's looking for is genuine, from the heart, authentic communication with God that evokes him to response, that's what he's looking for. And that's what we should be shooting for every single time. Now, that being said, let's do what, what, what we're here to do, and that's to put our eyes on God's Word. And let's read this section of Scripture right here, okay? You all there? All right. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Anyone, everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Well, of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him. So this is just part of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. We've been doing this for months. Red wall, red letter. Studying the words of Jesus Christ. He's 
called this great group of people up onto the hill to sit at his feet so he could teach them about how to flourish as humans. But not everybody goes up the hill. If you remember at the beginning of the sermon, he invites them to come, but not everybody comes. Only his disciples come. Only the ones who really want to know what he has to say. Only the ones who genuinely want to follow him. Those are his disciples. Those are the ones who will come and they will sit and they will listen to what he has to say. And I hope and pray that you're one of those people this morning. But he's teaching them how to flourish. He's teaching them the best way to live in this sermon. And there's something here this morning that we need to get. I got to get this through to you guys. I think it's so important here in this text that what this teaches there's something that we all absolutely positively need. this is bedrock truth and you've got to get this down deep inside of your heart in order to fully flourish you've got to get the truth that i'm going to try my best to share with you with clarity this morning it's found right here in the text jesus christ is going to help us get it right here right now okay so let me ask you this what is that when someone talks about um when christians fight you know when we all argue about what the Bible says, we all have difference of opinion, right? So what are the things that, that we always, I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard this, but I've heard it lots of times. What's the, what's the issues that are not open for discussion because they're bedrock, unchanged, the most important thing? God's will. Okay, keep coming. See if I can find it. Trinity. What is it? Salvation stuff. Those are all good answers. The answer that I've gotten most over the years is what Holly just said. Salvation issues. You know, we can talk about this, we can talk about that, but we do not, close-handed are the salvation issues, right? We, we can talk about a lot of things, but the things that are about salvation, those are not open for discussion, and I would totally beg to differ. I don't believe that that's the case at all. I think that the salvation issues... If you put salvation as the most important thing that's not open for discussion, that puts you in the spotlight. Your salvation puts you in the spotlight. And I think that the only participation in a spotlight that anyone else on the earth should have is that they should be up in the projector room with their hands on the spotlight, shining it on the one who is Jesus. And that's it. Everything is about him. The, listen, so I think the most important thing in the world, the most important thing in the church, the most important thing in the scriptures is the nature and character of Almighty God. That is the most important thing. And when you get that established, everything can flow out of that. You got to know who he is. He's the most important issue. A.W. Tozer, a famous pastor, he's now long gone, but I love listening to his stuff. He is an absolute hammer of truth. And you can do that when you're dead. You can say whatever you want, right? I still listen to his stuff. This is what he said. He said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's so true. That is all that matters. Nothing about yourself, nothing about me, nothing about your spouse or your kids. The most important thing, what pops into your mind when you think about God? That's the most important thing about you. And if the most important thing about you, if you think about God and the first thing that pops up is you, that's a problem. That's a problem. He is the main character of the universe. He is the main character in the text of Scripture from word to word. Jesus said to the Jewish guys, the, the leaders, he said, you search the Scriptures day and night looking for eternal life, when all the while they what? They point to me. Everything in the Bible points to him. So whether it's Genesis, Revelation, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Peter, Joshua, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, whatever it is, it's all about Jesus Christ. Too much preaching about ourselves. Too much preaching about your gifting and your position and your, your authority and your this and your that. And these things may be true and good, but what's the most important thing? Jesus Christ. Everything should be about him. How do we run the race with endurance? By setting our eyes on Christ the author and finisher of our faith. So everything that happens in the church should be about focusing, refocusing people back onto Jesus Christ all the time. And preaching should do just that all the time. All the time. And so listen, because of this truth, you're persisting in prayer. That's not the most important part of the text. Not at all. The most important part of the text, I believe, is found in verse 11. 
look, put your eyes on it again. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So here's the most important thing in the text. It's, we're establishing the nature and character of God. What's his name? His nature is to be a good gift giver. That's who God is. His, his nature is to gift his children. He's a generous deity. That's who our God is. And a lot of people don't know. They think, well, he's, he's the, he's the buzzkill in the sky. He doesn't want me to have any fun. He's got all these rules and regulations. He's a fun sucker. He might smite me if I misbehave. Okay, let's just get something straight. That's not who God is. God is a generous, gift-giving deity. And here's the thing. He doesn't need to be manipulated into generosity. He doesn't need to be convinced to be generous. He doesn't need to be begged into generosity in any way. That's not who he is. His nature is to be a good gift giver. That's who God is. That's who you're going to when you pray. He's a God who wants to give good gifts. No, the text not only says that he knows how to give good gifts. That's important. And that's why we always talk about study the word of God and then meditate on the word of God. Because what I mean by that is study what it means. And then you meditate on what does it mean to me. Right? We, we want to establish what it means. But then we want to understand what it means. What does it mean to Matt right now? What is, this, what is this word to your people? What does it mean to Matt right here, right now? So here's what it means, I believe. This is just me, but I believe this is what it is. It says that he not only knows how to give good gifts, that means he knows what a good gift is. Okay, you might not. Has anyone ever gone to the store because it's someone's birthday or a baby shower or an anniversary or whatever, and you go to the store and you walk the aisles and you're like, man, I just, what do I, what do I get this person? I don't know what to get them. What do I get them? What do you think they like? Do you think this would be good? Do you think, I don't know what to get them. Did you ever be there? Have you ever, ever been there? No idea what to get, right? Yeah, God's not like that. He doesn't show up at Kmart going, man, I just stress, I'm stressing. I don't know what to get these guys. I don't know what they need. No, he knows what good gifts are, right? He's God. He knows everything. So he knows, one, he knows what a good gift is. He knows, like, there's good gifts, there's bad gifts. He knows the ones that go in the good column. He knows what's good. He also knows how to give good gifts. That means he knows when to do it. He knows the right way to do it. He knows how to wrap it. He knows how to bow it. He knows when to give it. He knows how, and the text goes on to say that not only does he know what a good gift is, and he knows how to give it, but how much more will he give good gifts to those who ask, to those who ask. He, he is a good gift giver. Here's the deal with, with this. I believe that based on this nature of God, who God the Father is, wanting to gift his children, I believe that's why Jesus instructs us right here to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Because he knows what a good gift is, and he knows how to give it and when, and he will, but it's not always the way and time that you want. So here, I want you to do me this favor. In your Bible or in your notes, write down three letter P's right next to each other. Just P, P, P. Okay, and you wonder what that is for. Well, I, I would tell you that this is what it means. Based on the text, I believe that prayer positions you for the provision. Does that make sense? I think that because he knows what's good I, and, I, and he knows when to give it and that he will, based on the fact that he will, it's a truth of scripture, he will, you need to always be asking him for these things because he doesn't want to give them without you asking. It's there in the text. He, to, he gives you good gifts to those who ask. And so if you don't ask, he won't give. His desire is to give, and prayer puts you in the position to receive the provision that he wants to give you. But if you're not asking, it's not coming, right? That's what he wants, and that's what it says in God's word. And I believe that this same text right here, out of the, the, the mouth of Jesus Christ, is the inspiration for the author of Hebrews to pen this in Hebrews 11.6. He said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. What's faith? Well, the evidence of things not seen, 
you know. I don't see it, but I know that it is, you know. That's a definition, but I think here is a definition of faith too. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists, right? You, wouldn't, you don't want to pray to a God you don't even know if they're there listening, right? That's kind of useless. So what faith means is that you're going to actually come to this God believing that he hears you and he's there going, yeah, what's up, Casper? I want to hear this. But you have to believe that. That's faith. Without that belief, there's no faith in God. That's just a phony, ethereal thing. You don't even know if they're there listening. Your prayers are on the ceiling. But it goes on to say that anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists. That's one. And that he rewards those who earnestly or sincerely seek him. So when you come to God and in prayer, you have to, one, believe that he's there listening. And you also have to believe that when you're coming to him, that he actually will reward you for that. That when you're asking him for something, that he actually hears you and that he wants to give you that. That should be your default position of your heart. Knowing that this God that you say you worship is listening to you and wanting to do for you that which you're asking. That's his nature. And he doesn't have to be convinced of that. That's who he is. So even though he says that you're, you're coming toward him should be earnest, what comes to mind when I think of earnest is passionate, like out loud, get it, right? So yeah, passionate, but not frantic and not worried that he's not there or he's not going to help, but knowing and resting in the truth that his nature is to want to give. That's who he is. That's what Jesus teaches us. And it doesn't always happen the moment that you pray because he's the one who knows how to give the gifts. So maybe today's not the day that's going to be good for you to get what you're asking for. The same guy, Tozer, said this of this subject. He said, God never hurries. <laughs> there are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this is to quiet our spirits and relax our nerves. Like when the pressure's off of you and you know it's on him, but yet you know that you know that he's a God who hears and wants to give you the desires you're asking for. It can calm you. And so effective prayer is absolutely, yes, earnest. Get after that thing with all your heart, yet patiently and peacefully laying our heart out before the Lord because we know his nature. Right? That's how you pray. And, and it's not a, oh man, I know, I just, I don't want to ask him. I know it's going to be no. I just, well, maybe he's had a good day and maybe, maybe he's not in a bad mood and maybe he'll, no. That, that, that's not, it's not a, well, maybe, Lord, kind of, if, if I've been good enough and you're in a good enough mood and the people in China were good today and the people, and Israel's happy and, and no, that, that's not the way you pray. You pray to him earnestly, passionately, go after it, but, but, but in rest, knowing who you're talking to. He's a God whose desire is to give good gifts. That's who he is. So, this, the absolute truth is that his nature is to gift and reward his children. That's who he is. So let's pause there for a second because we've got to dispel this fallacy that's running around America and the world, okay? I don't know if, if you're a Christian or not, but have you ever heard anyone say, well, we're all God's children? Anyone ever hear that? Right? Yeah, hear it all the time. Now, that's a great thought. Eh, it'd be nice if that was true, but it's just not. Okay, we're all... Like, humans are made in his image. We're image bearers. We're creations of God. Like, I get that. Just like rhinoceros and elephants are creations. They don't look like him. They don't act like him. They're not made in his image. But there is creations. Um, trees are his creation. Uh, glaciers are his creation. All these things, that, everything you can lay your eyes on. Like, he created all. I get all that. But just because people are created by him, that doesn't mean that they are his children. Okay. That's reserved for some special folks, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be a jerk, but I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. Doesn't matter what I say, right? That's a place for an amen. Doesn't matter what I say. So if you go to John chapter 1, it would be awesome if you could do that. Go to John chapter 1. 
And look at verse 10. Just kind of holler out when you're there. I don't want you to miss it. You there? Okay. I thought them, them phones were supposed to make it fast, right? Hey, 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 hey. Easy, easy. Oh, yeah, we got to give them grace. That's true. Yeah. 1 10. So, John 1 10 says, and John's, you know, he's speaking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He created everything. This Word we find out in verse 14 is the one that put on flesh and came down here with us. So we know that he's talking about Jesus here, right? The one guy who came from heaven, put on skin, became a person, and walked around here. Right, so he's talking about Jesus, and so Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is the one that the Bible gives credit to speaking the universe into existence, right? Not God the Father, not God the Spirit, God the Son. Jesus Christ the Lord, in eternity past, he spoke and, and the worlds existed, okay? I don't get all that, but that's just what the Bible teaches, and so by faith, I'm just gonna believe that because I was not there, and neither were you, and so we're, we just believe that. We're Christians. And so John says this, that he, Jesus, came into the very world he created, okay? So there again, he's giving credit to Jesus as the creator of the universe and of the world, okay? So Jesus created the world, so that makes him deity, right? But the world, the people, didn't recognize him. So they saw this guy, he was Mary and Joseph's kid, so they recognized him there, because they were saying that often, like, hey, isn't that just Mary's kid? Isn't that just Joseph's kid? Yeah, he is. But it says that they didn't recognize him as what? As the creator. That's what he's talking about here, right? They didn't recognize him as the creator. He came to his own people, and, and even they rejected him. So they, didn't, they might have seen him as a person. Hey, that's the carpenter's kid. Hey, there's the rabbi. Like, that's awesome. But they didn't recognize him and acknowledge him as creator, as God, okay? And so they rejected him. But, here's a good but. Anytime there's a, a but in Scripture, it's usually followed up pretty good. It says, but to all who believed him and accepted him as what? As creator, right? Because that's the context here. Those who accepted him and believed in him as creator, he gave them the right to become children of God. So you see, not everybody is a child of God. Everyone is a creation of God, but they're not a child of God. So, but here's the good news. If you've bent the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord, God, creator, savior, and king, Okay, if you've bent the knee to him, then you are now God's child. And as a result of your bending of your knee, God's heart is now bent toward giving you good gifts. That's awesome, right? Because of what you've done there. So here, here's two things. So we know by, by, and it's easy, it's right there in the text, we know that God's nature is to give good gifts to his kids. Okay, that's right there, it's in the text. We can see it pretty clearly. But the motivation for doing it is not quite as clear. It's there. I'm going to show you. But, but you got to dig it out, okay? And, he, and here's where we're going to find it. It's, it's, it's wrapped up in these words. To those who ask him. Okay, the motivation is those who ask him. What do I mean by that? Let me ask you guys a question. If a person is giving of their resources... Isn't a person nice when they give without being asked? Wouldn't you agree? Like they're just a nice guy, nice gal. If they're just generous giving people and, they don't, and you don't have to ask them, but they just want to like give, 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 right? Isn't that awesome? And I agree with you. The problem is, is that that's a standard that we have for one another. And what we try to do is we try to impose our human standards on a supernatural God. That's not who he is. Now, we can have that standard for each other, but that doesn't mean we should, we should apply that standard to God. Because his word says that he gives good gifts when you ask him for it. He's not just the one who just throws it out. Like, you know, I went to the parade the other day, the George Fest, and they're just, everyone's on the side of the road. I was there with, with Meredith and the kids, and the, and the floats just go down the road, and they're just chucking candy everywhere, Right? Woo, 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 woo. I don't care who it goes to. I don't care how many cavities it causes. Just woo, candy everywhere, right? Yeah, that's not God. His word says that he gives good gifts 
to his children who ask for them. Okay, that's the motivation. So let me tell you what I'm talking about here. Psalm 23.3 says this. He refreshes my soul. Is that good? You have a bad week. Kids are driving you crazy. The economy's down. Your boss is a jerk. Just beat up, right? And so then what happens? You go to church or you open up your Bible or you're in your car and you're singing worship songs, you know, like crazy because nobody can hear you. You know what I'm talking about. You guys all think you're awesome in the car. I do. You just turn the music way up, right, and just start getting after it. We all think we're like Hillsong. We're not, but we think we are, and it's okay. It's good. And, and you meet with God in that, in that place, and he just, refre- you know, he just kind of builds you back up, and he, it's like Rocky, you know. You go into the ring, you get the tar beaten out of you, and you come back, you're bloody, and your nose is coming out of the side of your head, and he goes back to the corner, and Mickey patches him back up again. Refresh. Get back in there. And that's what it feels like when we... When we're all beat up and we come to God and we spend time with him and he just refreshes your soul. Like, so that's what? Thumbs up, right? That's a gift. Awesome, right? So the verse goes on to say, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. Like left to myself. I got 35 years of complete failure. Anyone else? Like no matter what I do, I couldn't make a good decision to save my life, right? Everything I thought, oh, this is going to be a good idea. You know, in the ditch, wheels up blown motor, (laughs) just a mess, right? I'm terrible at it. But you go to him, and you acknowledge him in all your ways, and he directs your steps. And you you open up the scriptures, and you're like, okay, this is better for me. And so that's good too, right? So he refreshes your soul. He tells you which way to go, what to do. It's good for you, right? That's awesome. But is it because you're awesome? Is it even because he loves you? That's a good reason he loves you, right? Do you guys understand that God loves you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son? Like, he must love you a lot, right? Because I don't know about you, but I'm not giving up Jackson for y'all. Like, I, I, you know, I mean, so you understand his level of love, but is that the motivation for refreshing your soul, guiding you down the right path? So let's just read the verse on. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. That's why. It's for his namesake. It's for his reputation. It's for him. That's why. He wants to bless your life and help you so that you can give him more glory. That's why he does it. Sounds selfish. like Because for us, if I do something for you because I want to get something out of it, that's not good, is it? But that's what God does. And if you want to argue with that, good luck. Like, you, you, you can do that all you want. But that's what he says. I do these things. Not for your name's sake, not for your own. Listen, when he does stuff for you, that's awesome. But your blessing is a byproduct at best. All of it is for him. Okay, here's some more. This is a deep and hard lesson to learn. But do me a favor. I think we'll have it on the, on the yeah, go to that. Go to page 434 in, in the Pew Bible. If you have your own Bible, go to Isaiah chapter 48. This one's brutal. But listen, if we're going to understand the nature and character of God, we need to understand everything the scripture would reveal about that nature. Okay, not just grace, 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 and not just, you know, smite and rules and judgment and wrath, but all of it, right? This is who God is. He's all those things. So Isaiah chapter 48, show of hands, who can agree with this, that that's them? Isaiah 48 Verse 8 says, For I know so well what traitors you are. You've been rebels from birth. <laughs> Raise your hand. Who, who can agree right here, honestly, that there's a standard that God has for people, but we've rebelled against it since the day we were born? Right? For even your little kids, right? You know, if you're a parent, you know your kids are rotten all the time, right? You don't have to teach them to be naughty. I've been hollering at my kids all morning right here in church. They're just that, we're just bent on that way, right? We're just bent on being rebellious to what is right and good. That's just the human race, right? All of us know that. So look what he says. I, I know you've been rebels since birth, yet for my own sake and for, this, and for the honor of my name, I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. It's not because you're awesome. It's because he's awesome, right? That's why. That's why he does this thing. Look what he says. 
It's because of my name I, I haven't wiped you out. However, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. So he's like, I, listen, I haven't wiped you out because of your wickedness, which you deserve. But I haven't, I haven't like turned the other cheek to it either. Like, I see what you're doing there. You're trying to be sneaky under the pews, but I see you. And so I'm, I'm, I'm spanking you a little bit. I'm letting you suffer some. Why? For my namesake. So that you can get back on track. Right? Because you're doing wrong. If, see, if, if we're parents and we let our kids get away with murder, they'll murder. Right? That's just the way it works. Right? If you just turn the other cheek and you don't even acknowledge it and you don't spank them at all and make it hurt a little bit, isn't that why we spank our kids? We spank our kids because a little hurt is better than the massive hurt of them walking out in front of a car. So, you know, like, don't run on the parking lot, naughty thing. Well, it's better than being dead, okay? So just take it. So that's what God's saying there. Like, listen, I, I, it's not like I'm turning the other cheek. I see what you're doing, and I'm spanking you a little bit. I want you to suffer a little bit. Why? I will rescue you. It goes on. He says, I will rescue you. Why, though? For my sake, for the sake, for my own sake, I will not let my reputation be tarnished. Guys, you are made in his image. So what you do represents who he is. Do you understand? When the lost world, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you if you're a Christian. So even more so now, you are representing the one who created you. And when you act the fool, you're making Jesus look the fool. And he doesn't want to look the fool. I will not have my reputation tarnished. I'm awesome. And I want you to represent that to the lost and hurting world. That's why he does these things for his namesake. He does give good gifts when you ask him, but it's because he wants the credit for it. That is his ultimate motivation for his own namesake. And we think that it's for us. We think that we're amazing. We think we're the center of everything. We think everything that he does, all the good and perfect gifts, they come to me because I'm incredible. Everything in our world is teaching you first, you central, you important, you number one, you, 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 you. That's, the, that's cancer to the human race. So think about this, and I think that this section of, of Scripture in Matthew 7, we think, and it's crazy because we think that the first section of the text is the most important. That's why most people, when you go to a church, they're preaching about keep praying because your blessing's right around the corner. That's what they get from this. And I'm like, no, like, no, the second half is the most important. That's the God stuff. It's the stuff about the Lord. It's, it's come to him. And he starts talking, Jesus starts talking about God, not about us. We think we're the most important thing. So if we keep praying, we'll get a blessing. And it's like, my, epic, epic point, man. So thinking about this, like, do you remember, this is my best illustration. Do you remember when you were in elementary school and they had those, those models of the solar system? And there was the sun in the middle, and then there was those metal bars that came out, you know, and Neptune, and Jupiter, and Uranus, and then Earth, and, and Venus, and all that. And out here was like, woo, way out here by Matt was Pluto. You remember, you remember those things? See, the problem is in our world is that, see, uh, all these things go around the sun. And that's the way it's supposed to be with us. All, everything else is out here on these things, and, and God's right here. But we've taken him off of there and stuck him out there by Pluto and stuck ourselves on the sun spot. That's the problem. And we need to switch that back. So this is what I mean. When I said earlier, you've got to get this foundational bedrock truth. You're not the middle. We're not the middle. Jesus Christ is the middle. You've got to take this, the sun, S-O-N, and put him where the S-U-N is. Like He is central, most important thing in the world, like, and no one, listen, no, when I say that we all think we're at the middle, like, no one's going to, like, Joe, you're not going to come up to me and go, I'm the center of the universe. Like, no one's going to say that, right? No one's going to say, I'm everything, look at me. No one's going to say that. But your actions will. See, and we might not be, like, deliberately trying to make ourselves awesome and puff ourselves up. 
but the way we live would tell a different story. How many people work? Or, you know, you're retired, but worked. Work. Okay, awesome. Can I ask a question, and don't yell out if you were here last night. Why do you work? Anyone? Why do you work? Pay bills. To eat. Are those good reasons? Okay, what else? Keep coming. Involve in the, in the sermon. Take care of the kids. You know you were here last night. Shh. What else? To pay Caesar, buy clothes. Are these all good reasons? Nothing wrong with that, right? I don't want anyone coming to church naked. So buy clothing is good. That's our dress code. Wear something. But, but the point is this. like, Those are all good and admirable things. But have you ever thought about this? Think of everything you just listed. Isn't that just not all, other than the Caesar thing, isn't that all just about you? Why do you have your job? So I can have clothing, I can have food, I can buy stuff for my kids, I can have a house, I can pay my rent, I can pay my mortgage, I can pay my car payment, I can pay I, 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 how about that? That was pretty good, right? But, but, but that, just, I'm just offering this. Can we just... Based on this whole solar system model that I was just talking about, could we just try this, that maybe you won't say you're the most important thing, but your actions say that you are. Could we just say that maybe, just maybe, that your job is not mostly to buy those things and pay for those things. Maybe your job was to create a thankfulness in your heart toward God. Maybe. Has anyone been unemployed and they prayed and asked God to get them a job? Raise your hand. Right? Okay, awesome. When you got the job, and you asked them and you got the job, did you thank them for it? Okay, that's good. But the question is, and that's good, but the question is, is now that you've had that job for like 12 years, every single time you get your paycheck from that job that God gave you that you thanked them for when you got the check from your boss, did you stop and go, thank you, God? Maybe it's, maybe your paycheck, I'm the Lord God who teaches thee to profit. Maybe it's not so you can make money for yourself or buy your stuff. Maybe, just maybe, it's to swell thanksgiving up in your heart to him. Based on what this is saying, he wants credit for things, right? So, so maybe that's why you got the job. Maybe he gave you the job so that that paycheck that you got was so that you can help other people so that you can introduce them to Jesus and advance his kingdom. Maybe your paycheck is not for you, and then you take your 10% and throw it in the basket. Listen, I, I'm just, uh, this is not the Bible, this is Moses. I think tithing is pathetic if we use that as an excuse to skimp on God what he deserves. I do. I think that if all, all good and perfect gifts come from him, that, that we, listen, if you tithe, but you just use it like, okay, that's just all I need to give, if that's the bent of your heart, that's dangerous. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, tithing can be good, but it can be bad if you perceive it wrong and think, okay, what's the minimum I need to give? Maybe he gave you the job and gave you profit and gave you income so that you could fund ministry to advance his kingdom so he gets more glory than yourself. Just thinking about these things. That's all I'm saying. How about your children? Why do you have children? Why do you have children? Reasons. I know, I get it. Only the child's going to say something. Still wondering. Why do you have children? Okay. Okay. So to continue your genome. It's good. What else? Why else do we have children? I know, but why do you want them? Okay. Let's leave it at that because we want them. What else? I asked for a godly child. Told us to. You were here last night. Yeah, but I was going to say that I'm not real happy with that. Keep the family, camp, keep the name going.
have a dad, watch him grow up, play some sports maybe, see him achieve, be an honest, um, contributing member of our society. Those are good things, right? So these are all awesome things, right? Are they bad? Not at all. Okay, but let me tell you what God says, because we're talking about, today we're talking about all things for his glory, not our own. I want them, I want to be a dad, I want to continue the name, I want to continue the genome, um, I want to be a dad, I want to see them grow up to be members of society. How, how about this though, Malachi 2.12, um, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? Like she didn't, I'm so happy that my wife is blind, do you understand, she's smoking hot and I'm fat and ugly and bald and a big nose and I have nothing to offer, that's the way I see it. And she's totally hot. I love that she's blind. Did she fall in love with me and come to me because I'm so awesome? If I think that, I'm, mis I'm mistaken because the Bible says, didn't I make you one with your wife? So credit to him, right? Credit to him, credit to him. And what does he want from this marriage? He says, what I want from your union is godly children. Do you see? Like he, he doesn't care if they play sports. He doesn't care if they go to college. He doesn't care if they're making you happy. Well, you know what he's wanting? He wants you to make more people that will worship him. That's why he has you have children. That's what he wants from your union. He wants godly children. children more, a king's glory is a growing population. He wants you to produce children so that those one, two, three, five to Giacomo 10 will worship him. That's what he wants. Because it's all about him. He wants credit and glory for all things. How about church? See, we won't say we're awesome. We won't say we're the center of everything. But what about church? Why do you come to church? You know, people come to church. They, and I'm, you know, I've been doing this now for a long time. So I know what people do. People come to a church and they have their checklist. Right? They have their checklist. And they're like, oh, okay, let me see here. Well... Well, they didn't greet me when I got here, so, you know, I deserve better than that. You know, that's an X. You know, because I'm awesome. And, uh, oh, that, he preached too long. That's an X. You know. And uh, he was talking about the Ten Commandments. He's legalistic. You know, he's like, uh, what about the children's ministry? Let me see that. Oh, that Meredith, she seemed nice, but uh, they don't have a water slide, so, yeah. Um, what about the music? Hmm. Too loud, yeah, that's not good. Um, I'm, I'm more into worship than I am the word, and they don't, they only play three songs, so that's, you know, yeah. and, um, oh, and, yeah, that's too long. I can't, you know, because I, you know, the game starts, and so that's, that's not going to work, and, um, do you have everything that I need here? You know, because I'm, I'm awesome, and I need this. See, we, we, let me just tell you this. Um, this needs to be thrown in the garbage because if we're Christians, then we're supposed to follow the Bible. And the Bible says that he places us. He places us. You don't get to go to 27 different churches and find out which one is best for you. What you need to do is acknowledge who he is and acknowledge your call, his calling on your life to send you to a church and you go in and they preach too long and the music's too loud, but God sent me here so I roll up my sleeves and I get to work. That's what I do. That's what church is supposed to be. And anything shy of that puts you at the center of the solar system model. And you're not. Listen, I, I love you all. I've had people, like, okay, here's the deal. The word of God says this, that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is right. And that God uses it to prepare his people for every good work, right? So, so, so why, why, why should I trim down my message lengths to appease your golden corral trip or your, or your son's buddy's got a jump house at his house for a party or a pony or a face paint? Like, I'm going to cut the most important thing that could ever go into your body. I should cut that short for your golden corral trip? I, I bet, listen... I preach a long time because if God gives me a message to give you out of love, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm not going to cut it short because you have schedules. That's not, this is the most important thing. And I've had people come to me and say, man, I love the message. It really helped, but it's just too long. They don't come here anymore because it's too long. 
I had someone in our church that I know and love, been coming for several years, precious to me. And, and this person has admitted to me that she's been going to church for 60 years. And she's learned lots of things. And she said, I've learned more in my eight years of being here at this church than I've, I've learned ever in, in the history of my life. But if you don't turn the bass down, you're going to lose me. I said, there's the door. And it was my mother-in-law. That's what you get in church. You know what that says? I'm the center of everything, not Jesus. The music's not good for me. The, 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 mes the message is too long. I don't like the seats. I don't like this. I don't like the fact that we have people that have come and gone from this church because we don't have a band. Who cares about a band, right? What are we doing here? Are we, are we worshiping? Uh, listen, last week Kyle was here. He is eye candy. Would you agree, ladies? Totally hot, right? And what happens is when, we get, when he's up there, a lot of people are looking at him instead of fixing their eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. So what's more important, the show or the content? If the words that we're singing this morning are pointing to Jesus and worshiping him and telling him how awesome he is, isn't that all that matters? Someone said to Francis Chan one time, this pastor, they said, man, Francis, I just didn't like the worship this morning. It just, I just didn't like it. He goes, that's awesome because it wasn't for you. Do you see what I'm talking about? Like, this is a, the church is for him. Everything's about him, right? The, the script, my favorite verse in scripture, Colossians 1.16, everything was created by him and for him, right? For him. He has designed the entire universe to be giving him credit and glory. And the problem is, is that we're trying to be a fish that's kind of going upstream and fighting the way the whole universe has been created. And that's why you get the friction and your life is rough because you're not living the way you're supposed to. Everything was for him, not for you. Especially the church. This is his house we are his people he's building it his way we are created for him you're a father not no offense but not to see your kids flourish you're a father for him you're a mom for him you're a grandpa for him you're a preacher for him you're an employee you're a lawyer for him you're a teacher for him you're a cop for him you're a husband for him a wife for him everything for him everything for him all glory to jesus christ and jesus christ alone so, with that in mind, and I believe this is true, what happens when good stuff just starts flowing into your life like a constant and steady flood, but without prayer? If you haven't prayed about this, but all this stuff is happening, what happens? You take this sun off and you put yourself there. <laughs> Look at me. Look at all that's happening to me, man. I must be awesome. <laughs> Now, you're not going to say that, but isn't that what we feel? Look at me, karma. I've got good luck. I must be awesome. Look at me, look at me. When good stuff starts flooding in like crazy, that's fertile ground for pride to take root. But when we ask God for something, and he specifically grants you that answer, then credit goes to him. And that's what he wants, right? If good stuff's happening and you didn't ask God for it, who takes the credit for it? You. But when you ask him for something and he does it, then he gets the credit for it. I never get tired of telling us. I had a friend come in town last night. I haven't seen him in 20 years. This is when we were really, really naughty. And he... Popped into my house last night, and we were up till 1 o'clock in the morning. I got to share my testimony. He's not a believer. I got to share my testimony. I got to share everything with him. He wasn't going to come by, and we were late and everything. And, I, and my buddy Greg was at my house last night, and he had talked to John. And he was going to pass. He's here in town. He lives in San Diego. He's been there 20 years. He's making like $4 million a year. He lives in this $11.5 million house. I saw pictures. It's just mind-blowing. Doesn't believe. And, I was, and we were going to go to bed, and I said, Greg, I need him here tonight. I, need, I don't care what time it is. I need him here tonight. I need to share with him. So he came. Praise God. I got to share this, lots of stuff with him. But in this right here about asking God for something. So I understand what the Bible says. 
about if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. But I also understand that it says you will be saved. And so I don't know, there's a lot of theology there. Does that mean you're saved right then and there? Because it says will. So maybe it's, I, I'm just, I don't want to argue about that because it doesn't matter. But I, I, I said that prayer. One day, Brent Bickhart, Pastor Brent, took me by the hands, I, we, we put our heads down, and I prayed that prayer. But I, I don't know that I got saved in that moment. I, I just don't know. But I do know, I do know this, that like six months later, when I was at my house, coming off of a caffeine addiction, and I stopped drinking coffee, and I had a massive headache, and it wouldn't go, did anyone ever have those headaches from caffeine withdrawal? Like, it's piercing, right? Like a knife in your head. And so, I ne listen, I hope I don't ruin my job as pastor here by telling you I've never heard the audible voice of God. Okay, I never have. But I do know that night after pain, pain, crying, tears, pain, like I wanted to jump off a bridge pain that I sensed in my little sensor down here, right? Pray to me. I'm, like, I'm laying in bed. It's one in the morning. Pray to me. Hello? You know, I don't know so I did. First time ever I did this. I'd been reading the Bible, and I said, all right, Jesus, it says in your word that you, you know, you raised the dead, you made the blind see, the lepers were healed, all this. I started naming off exactly what it said in Scripture. I said, I hate to bother you with something so minute, but would you please ease my pain? And wham! I got goosebumps over my whole body, and it was gone. Insane. That's when I got saved. I, 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 listen, that's when I got, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God existed at that moment because I couldn't explain it. But listen, I gave credit to him because I couldn't fix that. You know what I'm saying? I had already taken three Tylenol, nothing. I had no coffee in the house. I couldn't get the caffeine. I didn't know what to do. And I said, Jesus Christ, would you do this? And he did that specific thing right there. Credit and glory to God. That's what I'm talking about. So, when he does something, you give credit where credit is due. And so here's the deal. God's nature is to gift his children. It's to gift his children. However, the pinnacle of God's nature of generosity and giving good gifts to you isn't you. It's him. You gotta get this, man. You gotta get this. It's him. Paul knew this truth. He says, he wraps up in this very short but very profound statement, Galatians 1.5, all glory to God forever and ever, right? Not just some glory, not on occasion, not partial, all glory to God forever and ever. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from God our Father, right? We need to acknowledge the fact that anything good that comes into your life is from him. Even if it's given horizontally, if, Marty, if I'm hurting for money and Marty gives me 20 bucks for gas, right? Who am I thanking? God, right? The generosity put inside this wretched human's heart who doesn't, isn't bent, none of us are bent towards doing good. And the generosity that swells in our heart is because God put it there. So I, this is vertical. The gift came horizontally, but thanksgiving goes vertical. Everything is for him. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God the Father. And so that's where all thanksgiving should go and all credit should go. Back upward, not to ourself or to anybody else. We have to have a right view of who God is. He is central to the Christian life. He is wholly separate. He is good. He is generous. He is high and he is lifted up. He is supreme over all creation. Revelation 4.2 says, Behold, a single throne stood in heaven. One throne. And there was one on that throne. And it's not you. It's Jesus Christ the Lord. There's too much people preaching in the church. I've noticed this when I watch on lots of different pastors and stuff. They're always preaching about your position and your gifting and your authority and, 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 and all that God has done in you and who you are in Christ. And those are all fine and good and true. But that should not be the center of our preaching of God's word. The center of God's word is the word of God, Jesus Christ. That's what should be happening in the church. He's the main character of all of scripture. He's the main character of all of life. 
So yes, we are in him, and we are co-heirs with Christ, but always know this. There should be a healthy separation between you and all the rest of us. As my good friend Pastor Theo Bob says, I know there's a God, and I ain't him. And that's so very, very true. we got to get this right, guys. And because God's nature is to give generously, Jesus says, ask and seek and knock and persist in your pursuit because you never know when it's coming. See, we pray for stuff, right? And then it doesn't come. And you're like, oh, man. And you kind of stop praying, right? I ask for a little while and it doesn't really happen. And so, well, maybe God's not listening and maybe God's not real. Maybe God doesn't care. Whatever it is that you come up with, maybe, maybe, maybe just this. Maybe you're not at the center of your solar system. Maybe he is. And maybe, just maybe, he knows some things that you don't. Right? I got a kid. She's 14 years old. Adriana, I love her with all my heart. She's amazing and beautiful. But she's stupid because she's 14. Right? Who else was stupid when they are 14? Everyone. Right? She thinks she knows everything. Right? And I try to explain to her, listen, kid. I've lived beyond your 14 years. I'm not some oracle of of amazing wisdom, but I know what your choices as a 14-year-old are going to cause to happen. Like, I've lived it out already. You haven't. I don't even expect you to make a good choice because you don't know what 15 looks like. You're doing what a 14-year-old person should do. You're stupid. So let me help you. So with that in mind, if he's your father and he knows how to give good gifts... Maybe he's lived beyond your 73 years. Maybe he's lived beyond your whatever years. However, I don't know how old y'all are. But you know what I'm saying? Like maybe he knows something that you don't. And so maybe you're asking him for some things, but he hasn't given it to you yet because maybe the timing of the gift isn't right. Maybe you're asking for some financial blessing or something and because you're struggling and maybe he, like his nature is to give, right? He wants to be giving generously. That's who he is. And you're asking him for this thing, but maybe, just maybe, if you got that gift right now, maybe he knows something about you that you don't, and maybe you'd blow it on stupid stuff instead of funding ministry. Maybe there's something he needs to sort out in your heart first before he gives you something that's going to kill you. And you're like, I, I need it now. He's like, no, you don't need it now. You might need it next month, but you don't need it now. Or maybe he needs to see we're <laughs> we're trapped in our little world. Right? Like like Adriana, she's 14. She doesn't see 15, 16, 17, 30, 40, 60. She doesn't see that, right? We're kind of like that. Don't you understand? Like he's we're here and he's dealing with Pluto too. Like so there's this whole big fabric of things that he's working on to, to build a kingdom. And we're just thinking about a little thing. And maybe, just maybe he needs to sort some things out in someone else because maybe, maybe. Down the road, Jerome's going to need some help with something, and maybe it's financial. So maybe I'm over here asking, Lord, I need a little help, I need a little help. And he's like, yeah, I'll give it to you, but Jerome's going to need something in a month, so I'll give it to you then. Patience. I don't have any patience. I don't know about Jerome's need. I need it now. It's like, you wait. Because the, when he gives good gifts, he wants credit, right? So just think about this. You want the gift now, he wants high impact gifting that's going to make a difference that's going to bring him glory so maybe just maybe it's better to get it next month rather than right now perhaps in his sovereign governing your answer your provision or your healing will best suit listen this is painful maybe it'll best suit his plan rather than yours not easy to take but it's true Maybe it's better for his plan if you get it next month or next year or never because maybe it suits his plan, not yours. So maybe we just need to have a perspective change, right? Listen up. You guys are eternal beings. So we're like, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now. You're an eternal being. What does that mean? Forever, right? So we're eternal beings petitioning an eternal God who's building an eternal kingdom. 
but with our worldly, right now, microwave perspective implanted deep in our heart, we quit asking for stuff because it didn't happen by Tuesday. But he's an, you're an eternal being praying to an eternal God for an eternal kingdom. Maybe we need to change the way we look at stuff. God will gift his kids, but just maybe not by Tuesday. Isn't that okay? You have to learn to be okay with that. Like Tozer said, to be okay with that just calms the nerves, right? That's what we all need. That's a good gift. One of the reasons why I didn't want to preach this section, this was like months in the ahead of coming. To, I knew this was coming. I didn't want to preach it because what a preacher really always wants to do is he wants to try to take the text and then maybe give you some of examples in his life to kind of help you understand it, you know, perspective. I was like, man, I don't know what I could share, but then all of a sudden, boom, it hit me. So Meredith and I got married and we're trying to blend a family, Right? Anyone ever try to blend a family? What's the word that comes to mind for me is hell, right? Just is, it's difficult. I was in love with Meredith, and I wanted to spend every day with her, but my kids, they might not have wanted that. They wanted their mom. And, and maybe her kids, well, not maybe, her kids, <laughs> she was ready to hang out with me every day, but they were not ready to hang out with me every day and listen to me in my house. Yeah, that's not happening. So it was really difficult to blend a family. And so here's the deal. Without getting into too many details, but there was two people in this family of ours that were completely at odds for seven years. I'm talking yelling and screaming and insulting and fighting, and it was just awful. And you have to know, I'm sure you can understand, that me as the husband and dad, that's painful. And so you have to know that there was a lot of praying going on coming out of me, like I'm not talking about just a prayer before dinner. I'm talking about, you know, alone, snots coming out of my nose, tears pouring out like, God, I can't take this anymore. You have to do something or my family's going to explode. The church will be done. It's divorce time. Like, it's going to be brutal because, I mean, I was there. I was there. And I pleaded with the Lord, like, please do this. And it was constant all the time. Do you remember when Jesus got baptized in the Jordan River? And it says that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, like a dove, came down on him. So this is what happened. Seven years of, of praying. Seven years. That's a long time. Seven years. All of a sudden I was in the bedroom with one of the people in this problem. And all of a sudden the other one came in because they heard this one talking about them. And I was sitting there, and I was like, oh, boy, it's popping off right here. I was freaked out. I was like, oh, no, oh, no. And, and that other person walked in, and I went from this, like, <gasps> to, it was like the Holy Spirit went, and just, I, I, don't, I don't know why it happened that day, but all of a sudden, they started to talk. And I admit that I was wrong seeing you like this. And I admit I was wrong seeing you like this. And I thought, no, I didn't think that. And, I, and all of a sudden, they started to cry. And one said, well, why don't we just spend some time together? And I was like, and I'm just like, ah, like, done, done. And now, they're best of friends. They love each other. They're laughing, joke, totally restored. Seven years. Who gets the credit for that one? Awesome. I just want to encourage you with that. We need a perspective change. We have a life that's severely limited by, like, I live in Tavares at 4581 Marsh Harbor Drive. That's my little world. That's all I know. And the scriptures say that God fills the universe with himself. <laughs> He's so much bigger than me. 
And I'm limited by this space and time and seconds and minutes and hours and days and months and years. Maybe I get 80 or 90 of them at best, but we're praying to the everlasting to everlasting one. And so this everlasting Jesus is building a kingdom that spans not only the generations, but spans the globe. And he's knitting this whole thing together into a mind-blowing work of art. And so sometimes your request, although it's big to you in the moment, maybe the timing just isn't right in the eternal construction of the kingdom. But his desire is to give. So keep asking, persistently asking, persevere in prayer because he wants to do it, but when he finally does, he wants the glory for it, not you. And so sometimes we pray, right? And it's pray and pray and pray and crickets. You hear nothing from God, no answer. And I did it for seven years. And finally it came, but let's just talk this last thing before we close. We can talk about this stuff all day. We can draw some parallels. We can grab some principles out of this and point them to different parts of our life and how we should pray for this and that. But we should, when we read scripture, never, ever ignore the context in which it was written. And the context in which it was written was when Jesus was preaching about judging. He's talking about helping, pointing out the sin in someone else's life and helping them get out of it. But first... Get the log out of your own eye, right? Get the sin out of your own life first so that you can help your friends and brothers and sisters with the sin in their life. And so here's a prayer. Just look at the context. Here's a prayer that always gets answered. Oh, you wonder, keep seeking, keep asking. That doesn't mean you keep asking for the same thing over and over again. And hopefully someday he'll let you know what it is. No, no, no. He says, keep asking, keep seeking. Keep asking him this. Jesus, identify sin in my life. I got to get it out. Identify where my character is not the same as yours. Identify my failures. And if you ask that today, you will get an answer, right? You will get an answer. If you ask for that tomorrow, you will. If you ask for that every single day, he will point out to you the sin in your life so that you and he can work together to purge it out of your life. That type of prayer gets answered every single time. So his, his, his word is true. You keep asking, he'll give you an answer. You ask for that gift, that holy, perfect, awesome gift, and he will give it to you every time because that gives him glory all the time. See, the reason why he'll do this for you too is because you can't live this, this, the fullness of flourishing that he came to give you if you have sin lingering in you. So he's gonna answer that prayer every single solitary time. It always gets answered and it doesn't wait till next month. It'll happen right here, right now. Listen, we need to ask, we need to have more prayers that are help me be prayers rather than help me have prayers. That's why we're not getting answers right away. You want to get an answer right away? Jesus, help me be more like you. Wham! He's going to answer you. And I'm telling you right now, we're about to do that. And we're going to prove that Jesus is right every single time because we're going to ask him for that. We're going to get quiet right now in prayer before we do anything else. And we're going to take a moment and we're going to ask him to identify sin in our life, okay? So let's just do that right now. No, nothing fancy. Let's just close our eyes, cl just quiet our heart, and let's just do this. Let's just pray right here, right now. Lord Jesus, we want to see if you are right yet again. We want to know if we can trust you. We want to know, Lord, that you're a God that exists and that you reward those who earnestly seek you. And so, Lord, we are coming to you right now, right now, based on this word from your Bible, in the context in which it was written, where you said to keep asking. And if we ask, you would give good gifts. And it is our desire to get that good and pure, holy, righteous gift of identifying the sin in our life. So anything, Lord, whatever it is, point out to us right now 
what that sin is. Just tell us what it is. Identify it right now. We ask you this in Jesus' name. So just keep listening. Keep listening. Let's take a moment in quiet. me be more like you, Jesus. Where am I lacking in that? Point out a sin. Point out a flaw. Point out my sin, Lord. So, show of hands, who in the room, you don't have to admit what it is, who in the room sensed that God has identified any sin, sin pattern, anything that is wrong in your life that he wants to improve on with you? If he's spoken to you about anything, raise your hand. If he's identified any type of sin in your life, anything that's wrong. hate to cut him short because I believe a wholeheartedly that he's going to answer like hey you were you were you were you were mean to this person you you didn't give that person the attention that they deserve you see for me Paul says don't just pretend to love others and that's what popped into my mind that when I am speaking to one of you oftentimes I'm thinking about the next thing I have to do here at the church and so Oftentimes, I'm looking at you in the eye, but I'm not actually thinking about you. That's my flaw. So I need to do better with that. So like he pointed that out, I put my head down in the pulpit, boom, that's what came to mind. And I believe that he'll do that for each and every one of us if we ask. And I also believe with all my heart that if I ask him again tomorrow, he's going to point something else out that I need to do better with. Amen.